Uh, so thank you again, uh, Kirthana, and thank you to everybody who's come today. I hope this will be informative. And um, like we discussed, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the wee box below. Um, so we'll get started. Today, uh, we're hoping to describe the etiology, epidemiology and presentation and management of acute pancreatitis and also for chronic pancreatitis. And we should be able to cover the complications and prognosis of both of these conditions as well. So we'll start uh, with our first question and we'll give you a minute to answer this. So a 30-year-old woman has presented to A&E complaining of sudden onset epigastric pain that radiates to her back. She describes it as constant, but worse when she moves and she has vomited several times. Her bowels are opening normally. Uh, you look through her GP notes and you find that she's been referred to the community alcohol support scheme, but she has not been attending. On examination, she is guarding, but Rob's sign is negative. What is the most likely diagnosis? Good, so almost everybody got this correct. The correct answer is acute pancreatitis, and these patients classically present with epigastric pain that radiates around the back, and they usually vomit and they feel quite unwell. The most common causes of pancreatitis are gallstone disease and alcohol excess, and your basic tests that you'd want to do for any patient presenting with a history suspicious of pancreatitis would include a full set of bloods, including an amylase, and you're looking for an amylase that would be greater than three times the upper limit of normal. Patients um, might also get an erect chest x-ray and that's just because patients who present with epigastric pain who are unwell, you'd always want to exclude a uh, perforated viscous. And most patients uh, presenting with epigastric pain will get an ECG in hospital and that's just to exclude an abnormal presentation of an MI. Acute, pancre uh, sorry, acute appendicitis typically presents with periumbilical pain that then migrates to the right iliac fossa. And in these patients, you might see a positive Rosling sign. So that's when you palpate the left iliac fossa and it reproduces the pain in the right iliac fossa. An ectopic pregnancy is an important differential to remember in any woman of childbearing age who presents with abdominal pain. And you should always do a pregnancy test in these patients. The history given here is much more classical of that of pancreatitis. Uh, for patients um, who had presented with uh, a history suspicious of an ectopic pregnancy, you'd want to elicit any abdominal or pelvic pain, and you'd want to ask about uh, missed periods, vaginal bleeding, and asking about dizziness, shoulder hip pain, and other urinary symptoms. <clears throat> So going on to our next question now, a 50-year-old woman is admitted with an episode of suspected acute pancreatitis under the surgical team um, after she presented with acute upper abdominal pain. The team are still waiting for her blood results to come back. Which of the following single blood markers would be the most helpful in confirming her suspected diagnosis? And again, we'll give you one minute to answer this. Good. So again, the majority of people got this answer, answer correct. Um, you want to 
get a blood test, uh, sorry, a series of blood tests for any patient with suspected pancreatitis and one of your most useful ones, if not the most useful ones, going through your amylase. So an amylase of greater than three times the upper limit of normal is diagnostic for acute pancreatitis. However, it's important to remember that an amylase may also be raised in other conditions, for example, blunt trauma, mesenteric ischemia, small bowel inflammation, uh, gynae pathologies and various malignancies. An elevated serum lipase can also be used to diagnose pancreatitis, however, it is not as readily available. It's also a more expensive blood test. For a lipase, you're generally looking for three times the upper limit of normal, unless your own hospital policy guidelines would vary. CAA is particularly useful in, for example, colorectal uh, patients with colorectal cancer who have undergone a resection. And CEA is then um, used to monitor for recurrence. A white cell count may be used, as or may be raised in acute pancreatitis, however, it's not diagnostic, and it may be raised in a variety of inflammatory conditions and infections. Urea may be raised in dehydration, uh, renal disease, or even upper GI bleeds. However, it's not diagnostic for acute pancreatitis. So we'll now go into a third question. A 45-year-old female presents the emergency department with severe epigastric pain, radiating to the back and nausea. She's been referred to alcohol and support services by her GP, but she has not attended. She has no other medical problems. On examination, she is hypotensive and has a positive Cullen sign. What is the most likely diagnosis? Good. So the majority of people got this answer correct. Again, this is a very typical presentation of pancreatitis. So here you have a woman with significant alcohol history who's presented with abdominal pain radiating to the back and vomiting. Cullen's sign is not common, but it refers to bruising around the umbilicus, which may be seen in hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Hemorrhagic pancreatitis is characterized by bleeding within or around the pancreas and is usually a late finding pancreatitis. A hemorrhagic pancreatitis should be considered an emergency when it, recur when it occurs as a result of a pseudoaneurysm rupture. This patient is quite unwell given that she's fairly young and now hypertensive and patients like these should always be discussed with your registrar, especially if there are concerns regarding hemorrhagic pancreatitis. A perforated viscous or a perforated duodenal ulcer uh, would also present with severe abdominal pain and the patient may also be hypertensive. However, you wouldn't necessarily expect them to have periumbilical bruising. And again, this history is much more in keeping with pancreatitis given the alcohol excess. Uh, you may see a variceal bleeding patients with past medical history of alcohol excess or liver disease. However, these patients would typically present with a big upper GI bleed or melina, and again, they may be profoundly unwell. And finally, a splenic rupture is fairly uncommon in the absence of trauma or predisposing conditions. <clears throat> so acute pancreatitis is characterized by inflammation of the pancreas, and this is very common. It's also a disease that is becoming more prevalent in this day and age. In comparison to chronic pancreatitis, the pancreas recovers following an episode of acute pancreatitis, and your patient um, will generally still produce your necessary enzymes and hormones. It is a disease that carries a very high mortality rate. So the mortality rate generally is around 5%, but in severe pancreatitis, the mortality rate is thought to be closer to 25%. The most common cause of pan acute pancreatitis in the UK is gallstones, and the most common cause worldwide is alcohol excess. 
It is, however, important to remember the other causes of pancreatitis, which would include various malignancies, hypercalcemia, ERCP, a trauma, or infections such as mumps and EBV, uh, other autoimmune conditions, and certain drugs. So, for example, the most commonly encountered drugs um, that patients are on would include things like furosemide and thiazide diuretics. And again, these are medicines that are associated with an increased incidence of acute pancreatitis. So we've discussed a little bit about this already, but your typical presentation of a patient with acute pancreatitis is that of epigastric pain that radiates to the back. It's usually quite a constant pain. It's severe. A lot of patients will describe it as 10 out of 10. It may also be associated um, with guarding and worsened on movement. Patients usually vomit quite a lot and they will feel unwell. Jaundice is really quite uncommon, but it might be present in patients with severe gallstone pancreatitis. For a patient who presents with painless jaundice, you'd also want to exclude a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Cullen sign is the bruising around the umbilicus, which we've discussed earlier, and Gray Turner sign is bruising of the flanks, and both of these are associated with hemorrhagic pancreatitis. <clears throat> so these patients should have a full set of bloods on admission. You generally want a full blood count, usenes, LFT, CRP, amylase. Um, so for example, in your full blood count and your white cell count, um, you're looking to see an elevated white cell count. Um, your CRP is used as an early indicator of severity and is useful for predicting which patients may develop pancreatic necrosis. So for example, if a patient has a CRP of greater than 200, they're at risk of um, developing severe pancreatitis. Patients with pancreatitis may become dehydrated or hypovolemic, so it's very important to monitor their renal function. An ALT that is greater than three times the upper limit of normal is associated with gallstone pancreatitis. And again, in terms of your basic imaging tests, um, most patients will get a chest x-ray and that's just to exclude any free air under the diaphragm. So for example, if a patient actually had a perforated viscous with a similar presentation. Um, ultrasound is most commonly performed upon the viewer first line in imaging, imaging investigations to uh, confirm your diagnosis. So it's cheap, it's readily available, and it can be used in men and women with um, no risks of radiation. CT is generally not performed um, as soon as the patient is admitted, unless the diagnosis is unclear. So CT scan is much more useful after 24 to 48 hours into the presentation, because at that point it can be used to identify um, local complications of your acute pancreatitis. So for example, pancreatic necrosis or um, formation of collections. The Glasgow Emory criteria is a scoring system used to predict the severity of pancreatitis. And the criteria are typically scored at 40 hours after admission. And so, as you can see, it's a points-based system where you score points for different um, clinical factors. So age plays a part. Your basic blood test will be able to give you your albumin, calcium, glucose, urea, and white cell count. You want to add on an LDH to monitor that. And generally speaking, to get a good arterial APO2, you'd want to get an ABG. A score of three or above is essentially a high risk for developing severe pancreatitis. And these patients should ideally be managed with, uh, within HDU or ICU, or at least with a lot of senior input and discussion. So we're now moving on to the next question. A 50 year old alcoholic is diagnosed with acute pancreatitis in a &E after they presented with abdominal pain. She's waiting to be seen by the surgical team, but becomes acutely unwell within the department. She's tachycardic at 120 beats per minute. She's hypotensive at 80 over 45. Her temperature is 36.7 and her respiratory rate is slightly raised at 21. Her oxygen saturations are within normal limits. Which of these is the most uh, appropriate initial management for this patient? 
Good. So the majority of people got this correct. This is an acutely unwell surgical patient and she needs to be resuscitated. She's tachycardic and hypotensive and she needs IV fluids. So fluids that are very good for resuscitating patients include Hartman's and saline. Um, fluids like dextrose are not good for resuscitating these patients. Subutyl, subutamol is very useful for a variety of respiratory conditions, including asthma and COPD. ERCP is particularly useful if there is an obstruction of the COPD. So, for example, if it's become obstructed by the gallstones. Surgery is not routinely performed for acute pancreatitis. It's really only considered if patients have severe complications that cannot be managed medically or endoscopically. Um, in some hospitals, patients with pancreatitis are actually managed under the care of medics. And that's because the mainstay of management of pancreatitis is your supportive measures like IV fluids and good analgesia and antiemetics. Antibiotics are not indicated unless there's a clear source of infection associated with the pancreatitis. So now we have a 50 year old woman who presents with a past medical history of obesity and she has severe constant upper epigastric pain and she's been given a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. She tells you that she underwent a procedure a few days ago to investigate a possible stricture of her bile duct and she's other well and has no relevant social or family history. Which of the following is the most likely cause for her uh, presentation of acute pancreatitis? Good. So again, most people got this answer correct. This is a patient who's had an ERCP. Uh, pancreatitis is the most common serious complication of ERCP. And again, these patients will present with abdominal pain. Their bloods will show a raised amylase and probably a raised white cell count. Post ERCP pancreatitis generally develops within 24 hours of the procedure. And it's important to remember that these patients have become, become very unwell very quickly. Again, your management consists of good analgesia, IV fluids and other supportive measures. And it would not be unreasonable to discuss these patients with your seniors and um, HDU if you're concerned about this patient. Uh, gallstones are associated with obesity and gallstones are commonly implicated in pancreatitis. However, this history clearly describes somebody who has just undergone an ERCP and we're also told that this patient has uh, no other medical history and she's generally fit and well. Scorpion stings are a recognized cause of pancreatitis. However, they're very uncommon. So when thinking about the management of acute pancreatitis, a lot of it is very supportive. So you want to adequately fluid resuscitate this patient or your patients, and you want to make sure that they've got good analgesia Often for patients with severe pancreatitis, they need strong painkillers um, like strong opiates. So for example, IV morphine or oral morphine. You can also give them antiemetics to help with nausea and vomiting. And where possible, you want to encourage these patients to continue to eat and drink as they would do normally. If the bile duct has become obstructed with gallstones, you'd consider ERCP to remove them and uh, relieve the obstruction. And this would also help with their management. For patients with a significant alcohol um, history, you'd want to offer them support both in hospital and out of hospital. So, for example, in hospital, patients might be offered a variety of medicines to help them detox and to help them stay off alcohol. You might also need to offer the medicines to prevent them from developing symptoms of withdrawal. It's really important to offer these patients nutritional support. So, for example, by encouraging them to eat and drink, by ensuring that they have a food chart in their notes and um, it might be necessary to liaise with the dietitians to see if they can offer any supplementary nutritional drinks or any input regarding their current diet. 
It's important to correct any um, electrolyte abnormalities, and this may be done intravenously. So for example, giving them intravenous supplements. And if the patient is to develop a clear so source of infection associated with their pancreatitis, you'd want to consider giving them antibiotics at this point as well. So acute pancreatitis is a disease that is associated with high mortality rate and high morbidity rates. Um, generally, there is an 80% survival in mild, mild disease with patients who are managed conservatively. And again, we have quite a high mortality rate in severe cases with variable long-term prognosis. Patients may develop renal failure in severe pancreatitis, and this develops as a result of organ dysfunction and carries a very poor prognosis. If renal failure develops, then the patient may need some form of dialysis. More commonly, patients may develop an acute kidney injury, and this um, can occur as a result of dehydration or even hypovolemia. Uh, pancreatic abscess is a fairly late complication of severe acute pancreatitis, and they commonly occur around three to four weeks after the onset of their pancreatitis. If you're concerned about an abscess, you'd want to get a CT scan because that's the most accurate way to diagnose them. Pseudocysts commonly occur following acute pancreatitis, and they develop because of the pancreatic enzyme leakage. GI fistulas um, are recognised complications of acute pancreatitis and a pancreatic fistula is essentially an abnormal communication between the pancreas and other organs and this is due to the leakage of pancreatic secretions from the damaged pancreas. And again, patients um, with multiple attacks of acute pancreatitis are at risk of developing chronic pancreatitis. So we'll now lead on to question six. A 48-year-old gentleman is admitted to hospital for a distal pancreatectomy due to chronic pancreatitis. He is at risk of developing alcohol withdrawal seizures as he usually drinks a bottle of vodka every day. Which of the following is the most appropriate medication to help prevent this from happening? Okay, so we had some mixed answers for this one. The correct answer is chlorodiazepoxide. This is a long-acting benzodiazepine and is very useful for treating alcohol withdrawal. It is often considered the first choice drug for alcohol detoxes. It is important to check with your local hospital policy guidelines. So for example, there are a variety of hospitals that use diazepam. And this can be used in either symptom-triggered fashion or it can be prescribed as a reducing dose regime. For patients with liver disease, um, you might choose to avoid diazepam and lorazepam can be used instead. Methadone is used to manage heroin dependency and naloxone is used as an opiate reversal agent and heparin is used as an anticoagulant and can be used um, for a variety of different surgical procedures. So chronic pancreatitis usually results as um, a result of chronic or excess alcohol consumption. And you may find that patients with multiple episodes of acute pancreatitis then go on to develop chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis is characterized by chronic inflammation of the pancreas. Uh, like we discussed earlier, acute pancreatitis is generally very self-limiting and the damage to the pancreas is reversible. Chronic pancreatitis, however, is characterized by chronic or recurrent abdominal pain and progressive non-reversible damage to the pancreas. It's important to take a really good history from your patient and explore all of their clinical records. Um, and this is to help you determine the nature of your patient's pancreatitis. So for example, some patients may simply have uh, lots of attacks of acute pancreatitis, um, which resolves. And these may be as a result of alcohol excess, gallstones, medication, so forth. 
And the key for those patients is that the inflammation resolves between the episodes and the pancreas can still function. For some patients, there may never be a clear cause identified for their pancreatitis, and we'd call that idiopathic pancreatitis. Patients with chronic relapsing pancreatitis have relapsing pain that's not clinically recognized as chronic pancreatitis. So for example, they don't really have the same hallmark features. However, in these patients, if you're to take a tissue specimen, then you'd see the changes characteristic of chronic pancreatitis. And finally, um, patients with established chronic pancreatitis present with your typical features of abdominal pain, um, radiating to the back, vomiting, and reduced pancreatic function, and that includes reduced pancreatic exocrine and endocrine function, and their subsequent sequelae, so for example, steatorrhea and diabetes. <clears throat> so, like we said, we've discussed a little bit about the clinical um, signs and symptoms that they may present with. Um, in chronic pancreatitis, because of the inflammation and fibrosis, you end up with irreversible damage um, and patients may therefore become malnourished. And this is because they're unable to make key enzymes and they're unable to absorb key nutrients. Similarly, chronic inflammation also describes the endocrine um, function of the pancreas and patients can develop diabetes. Steatorrhea is a major consequence of chronic pancreatitis and usually occurs in the later stages of diseases, of the disease. Uh, jaundice is not that common, but it occurs in some patients with chronic pancreatitis, and this can be because of CBD obstruction or compression. Investigations would include taking a full set of bloods, um, and CT scanning or MRI scanning is useful for investigating chronic pancreatitis. So, for example, it could help to identify any areas of calcification, any enlargement of the pancreas or any ductal dilatation. Endoscopic ultrasound isn't as readily available, but can be particularly useful if the CT has been inconclusive. So, for example, um, endoscopic ultrasound is quite uh, good for distinguishing between chronic pancreatitis and malignant masses. Um, so, question seven. A 60-year-old woman with a known history of chronic pancreatitis secondary to celiac disease is discussing options for her surgery as her alkaline phosphatase is persistently raised. Which one of the following is a known method of surgery used for biliary decompression? Good. So this was, a, this was actually a much more difficult question. In this case, a raised ALP is suggestive of biliary obstruction. So bile duct structures can develop in patients with advanced um, chronic pancreatitis. The clinical presentation can vary and some patients may be jaundiced or suffer episodes of cholangitis, whilst other structures might actually be picked up incidentally and um, patients may not be symptomatic at all. Generally speaking, patients can be managed conservatively if the stretcher has been identified as an incidental finding and if the patient is not symptomatic. Surgical biliary drainage is indicated if the patient has been jaundiced for over a month or if the ALP has been twice the upper limit of normal for more than a month. Endoscopic biliary stenting has a high success rate and is useful for managing jaundice in the short term. The difficulty with stenting is that become, is stents can become blocked or can migrate, but generally speaking, it is a much less invasive procedure than actually for performing a colodocal jejunostomy. A colodocal jejunostomy is a procedure that creates an anastomosis of the CBD to the jejunum and can be used for biliary decompression. However, it is really important to remember that this is not a common surgery. 
Um, I think more typically speaking, it'd be used for stone disease or for patients with various biliary malignancies. Generally speaking, uh, most episodes of chronic pancreatitis can be managed conservatively. So we have a 65 year old gentleman is diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis. He has never um, had alcohol and nor has he smoked, but he does have significant medical problems. Which of the following conditions is associated with chronic pancreatitis? Good, the majority of people got this correct. So diabetes may complicate chronic pancreatitis. And this because in, this occurs because in chronic pancreatitis, you have inflammation of the pancreas and the pancreas um, then suffers ongoing fibrosis. This means that you have destruction of the endocrine function of the pancreas. And so your pancreas will then decrease um, not produce as much insulin and somatostatin and glucagon and things like that. Um, so the patient essentially develops diabetes as a result of this ongoing chronic inflammation. Chronic pancreatitis is associated with an increased risk of developing pancreatic cancer. Um, and patients may have a variety of other comorbidities, um, but certainly chronic pancreatitis is associated with diabetes. And so now, I think this is actually our last question. A 67 year old alcoholic with known chronic pancreatitis presents with abdominal pain in his right upper quadrant. He describes the pain as being much worse than usual. He is also more jaundiced and his liver function tests show evidence of obstruction. A CT scan of the abdomen shows a well circumscribed collection of peripancreatic fluid surrounded by a well defined enhancing wall. What is the most likely diagnosis? Good. Uh, the correct answer was B, a pancreatic pseudocyst. And so a pancreatic pseudocyst is a fluid collection and it's typically described as being contained within a well-defined capsule. And the capsule itself is often made of fibrous or granulation tissue. Pseudocysts can develop, uh, sorry, persist for quite a long time. So for example, they might be present for over a month and they can actually develop in both acute and chronic pancreatitis. Some patients may not be symptomatic, whilst others um, may suffer from abdominal pain, nausea and vomis, vomiting. Here we have a pseudocyst that has um, created a mass effect as such and has resulted in obstruction of the biliary tree. And that's why your patient has deranged LFTs and why they're jaundiced. A pancreatic, sorry, a pancreatic cancer normally presents with painless jaundice. However, the CT scan findings would be slightly different. So pancreatic cancers are typically described as poorly defined masses on CT. Uh, gallstones would present with right upper quadrant pain and the CT scan would show gallstones within the gallbladder. And your patient wouldn't normally be ja jaundiced with gallstones unless the gallstones had actually slipped into the CBD um, and that would give you an obstructive picture. <laughs> 
Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is an infection of ascites, and it's usually seen in the context of patients with liver disease. And a lot of patients with hepatitis B infection are asymptomatic, although some will present with complications such as cirrhosis, HCC, or liver failure. Um, generally speaking, to see a fluid collection within a well circumscribed um, enhancing wall is quite typical of a pseudocyst. So generally speaking, your management of chronic pancreatitis involves a lot of conservative and supportive care. So as best as possible, you want to encourage your patient to live a healthy lifestyle and where possible to stop drinking alcohol completely. The goals of your treatment are to reduce pain, to correct weight loss and nutritional deficiencies, to help maintain their bone health, to manage their diabetes and other complications, and generally speaking, to try and improve uh, their quality of life. Stopping smoking may also provide some benefit. Some patients may also require dietary advice or pancreatic enzyme supplements like Creon. And the enzyme supplements are usually taken with meals or snacks, and this is to mimic the normal postprandial secretion of pancreatic enzymes. There are some surgical procedures that can be formed. However, these are generally quite uncommon. So biliary decompression could be considered if, if the ALP has been persistently raised for over a month. And like we spoke about earlier, biliary decompression can be achieved using endoscopic or surgical techniques. Endoscopic biliary stenting is really useful in the fact that it's got a very high success rate. However, your downfalls are that the stents can become blocked easily or migrate. Surgical decompression does have slightly better long-term results than endoscopic techniques. However, it is more invasive, it's less readily available, and some patients may not actually be fit enough to undergo various surgical procedures. Patients with uh, pseudocysts that are um, persistent and symptomatic, uh, these patients may be offered endoscopic drainage, for example, if they're really uncomfortable or if they become infected. And a distal pancreatectomy could be considered in a small number of patients with pseudocysts and fibrosis limited to the tail of pancreas and for patients with really chronic and persisting pain. However, this is not a very commonly um, performed procedure. It's also thought in some patients that the pain from chronic pancreatitis is actually thought to come from the pancreatic head. And so performing a distal pancreatectomy might not be that useful in these patients. So, like we discussed earlier, your complications of chronic pancreatitis include pan pan pancreatic insufficiency, diabetes, obstruction, pancreatic cancer, pseudocyst, and they may also develop other alcohol-related diseases. And I believe that's us at the end of our presentation. I think there's just the one.